Good morning and welcome to worship. Lord, you are in our midst. We bear your name. Let's worship God now as we sing Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
and let us pray. Lord our God, we come to you in our risen Lord Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Open our hearts to your unbounded love that we may respond with our own love and grow in love of our sisters and brothers, your dear children. Lord Jesus, you are the resurrection and the life. By your Holy Spirit, prompt us not to cling to the fears of this world, but to find freedom in your love. As you have forgiven us, help us to receive your forgiveness and to learn from you to forgive others so that our lives are not all tangled up in pain and resentment, but are free by the forgiveness that you give us to live life to the full, to deal with whatever needs to be dealt with in your healing, merciful justice and for the glory of God in our lives, in the world and eternally. And we make our prayer in Jesus' name and together aloud we pray as he taught us saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Girls and boys, I hope you are well and I hope you're enjoying the good weather. Well, I have a story for you today. And here it is. There are just a few stories in the Bible about Jesus meeting his disciples after he rose from the dead, after he'd been crucified and died and after he rose again. Just, just a few stories. And here's one of them. So after the disciples found out that Jesus was alive again, they were wondering, well, you know, now what do we do? So one evening, Peter, do you remember Peter was a fisherman? He said to some of the others who were fishermen, come on, let's go fishing. And they said, yeah, yeah, we'll go with you. So out they went, and it was very common there for people, for fishermen to work at night. And so out they went. Now, when you're in a low boat on the Sea of Galilee there, where they would have been fishing, you can't really see the shadows on the water and so on, and it's quite hard to see into the water, even though the water is nice and clean. And quite often, they would get a friend to stand out on the shore, and the person standing on the shore might stand on a little hill or something, and they'd be able to see into the nice clear water and they'd say, quick, quick, on the left or on the right, whenever they saw a shoal of fish going nearby and the fishermen in the boat would be waiting and say, well, left, and they'd throw in the net or on the right, and they'd throw in the net on the right and they'd maybe catch some fish. And so they all helped each other in that way. Well, anyway, on this particular night, Peter and all the other fishermen in the boat, they worked all night and they caught nothing, not even one single fish. As morning dawned and it was time to come in again to the land, they were all really tired and they were all a bit grumpy, as you would be if you had worked all night and you caught nothing. And then they saw, you know the way when it's just early in the morning and you, can, you can't really see all the, face, the, all the face of the person clearly, but you can just see kind of like a shadow, a silhouette. And this voice from the shore called, lads, did you catch anything? Not even one, they called back. And then the man on the shore said, quick, throw in your nets on the right. And they did. And they caught the biggest catch of fish they had ever caught in their whole lives. So big, it was just amazing that they didn't tear the net with all the fish inside it. They, could hardly, they couldn't even pull them into the boat. And they looked at the man on the shore again. And suddenly Peter just knew who it was. And he pulled on his robe and he jumped into the water and he waded to the shore to meet Jesus. And can you see that in the picture there? He's jumping in and he's wading to the shore, pulling the net in to meet Jesus. Because as well as Jesus being his friend, Peter now knew that he was God's son as well. And he wanted to worship him as well as to hug him. And that's why he put on his clothes, because that was the right way to do it in those days. 
And can you see there on the beach, Jesus has lit a fire and he's cooking some fresh bread. Can you just see the bread there in the picture? And it just smelt gorgeous. Bring me some of those fish, said Jesus. I'll cook your breakfast for you. Well, I want us to think about this today. This is a story about Jesus being real when he rose from the dead. He met his friends when they were just doing ordinary things, just their ordinary work. He cared about them and he helped them with the ordinary work that they had to do. And he made them a lovely breakfast because he knew they were really going to be tired and hungry after being out fishing all night. So here's the thing to think about. Jesus will meet you today. He will. He'll meet you today. He's always with you. And he will speak to you when you're doing ordinary things. Maybe when you're helping clear up after dinner or maybe when you're doing your homework or when you're playing. You just stop and think, Jesus, are you there? What are you saying to me? He wants you to know that he's always with you and he's always ready to help you. And he loves you all the time. He loves you. Even if you're a bit grumpy or you're having a bit of an argument with somebody, he still loves you and he wants you to know that because that helps you to love other people as well. So make sure that you keep talking to him all the time. When you're feeling really happy and you're being really good and helpful, when you're being a bit grumpy as well, still talk to Jesus anyway, because he's always there and he always loves you and he always wants to help you with whatever you need. And it'll always make you feel happier. If you're very happy already, you'll feel even happier. If you're not feeling happy, well, he will help you to feel happy because he loves you. So then you will have more love and more happiness to share with other people as well. So let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that you always are there when we're doing ordinary things. Help us to talk to you so that we notice that you're there and that you love us and that you help us to share your love with others. Amen. So our hymn is about not giving in to temptation. Sometimes we feel tempted just to turn away from Jesus and to turn away from other people. Don't do that. Yield not to temptation. Don't give in to those tempting thoughts. And that's what we're going to sing about now.
Our reading today is from John chapter 21, verses 1 to 14. Let's listen for God's word to us through this scripture. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, or the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you caught any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals and there was some fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring me some of the fish you've caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Amen. And may God bless to us his reading from his word. Is there anything you find hard to forgive somebody else for? Is there anything you find hard to forgive yourself for? Or to believe that you are forgiven for? Or even to dare ask forgiveness for? From maybe somebody else or indeed from God? Well, if you're like most human beings, then the answer probably is yes. There are some things that we find very hard either to forgive or to ask forgiveness for. Which is why forgiveness is at the very centre of Christianity. It's the very heart of why God sent his son Jesus. It's why a key part, not an optional extra, of the prayer Jesus taught us is about forgiveness. It's why Jesus died on Good Friday and rose from death on Easter Sunday. It's what saves us from all the time being tangled up with those who do us wrong. It's what saves us from the fear of living lives trying to hide from condemnation. It's what frees us up to live in God's love now in our days on earth and eternally forgiveness. Today's reading can teach us much about forgiveness. Firstly, Jesus' power to forgive. I've heard many people say, and I'm sure you have too, well, my God, forgive them because I never will. Or even, how could God forgive someone who has done whatever it is? John wants us to know that Jesus does have the power to forgive because he has taken on himself and into himself all the effects of harm and harm and wrong and evil. Sin, in other words, in all its manifestations, even death. That's what the cross is all about. 
Now that would be all very noble and compassionate if that's where it ended. Our Lord coming and taking on himself all the sin and harm and hurt of the world. But it would also mean that evil and harm and sin of all sort had somehow had the final word and had ended the life of God, had defeated God indeed. And that's why Easter, the resurrection, is the final word, is what changes all of that and turns apparent defeat into triumph. Shows that the forces of fear and destruction and death and despair, they're all swallowed up with the only real power, the power of love, the power of love to forgive which opens up the possibility of God's unstoppable life and freedom to live. And that is why John is so keen for us to know that Jesus' resurrection is real. There were many, and indeed there still are many, who said that Jesus' resurrection was sort of like a vision or even a hallucination. John and the other gospels insist that the risen Jesus is a real person. If it were not, then the cross, representing all kinds of harm and betrayal and fear in every form, that would be the ultimate force that controls and limits and binds us. As Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth, if this were not true, then really we would be the most pitiable people on earth. And that is why John and the other gospel writers want us to know that Jesus really rose from death that the grave really was empty, that Jesus really did appear to his disciples, not just as a spirit, but as flesh and blood, albeit transformed, no longer limited by time and space, but totally free to lead his followers, us if we choose to follow, into the freedom of life lived in forgiveness, in God's love, not just in the hereafter, but right here and right now, as flesh and blood people in this material world. And so John tells us of Jesus appearing at the lakeside and giving the fishermen a hand. Actually, John doesn't tell this story as a miracle. It was just quite an ordinary way of fishing on the Lake of Galilee. Standing on slightly higher ground on the shore, a person was, able to better, was better able to see down through the shadows and through the reflections of the water and so on and could see the shoals of fish swimming in the water. And they'd call out to those who are on the boat, telling them where to cast their nets whenever a shoal would swim nearby to the boat. So Jesus was just joining them in their ordinary everyday work. Probably being silhouetted in the early morning light, it wasn't easy to see his features. But John, the beloved disciple, and Peter were in no doubt about who it was. It can seem a bit strange to us that G Peter would put his clothes on to jump into the water before wading ashore to greet Jesus. But by Jewish law, a greeting was a reverent act, a religious act even, and you should be clothed for it. So as well as being excited to see Jesus as a friend, Peter was also reverently greeting Jesus as his Lord and his God. Jesus then cooks and serves them a real breakfast. Earlier, at the end of chapter 20, John says that he, couldn't, he could never write down every single thing that Jesus did and said, but that the reason he writes what he does is that so that we, the readers, may believe that Jesus is the Messiah and, in trusting, may he have life in him. So John tells us this story of how Jesus joined the disciples in their ordinary, normal, daily work and cooked a breakfast for them to make it clear to us, the readers, that the resurrection isn't just a symbol or a metaphor, but that it's real. That the resurrection is not to be understood as a vision, but as Jesus being physically risen from death thereby showing that our physical life and the material life of this world matters eternally to God. 
and that Jesus has conquered the life-limiting forces of death and fear so that we can be free to live in God's forgiveness and God's love, not just in the hereafter, but starting right now, if we choose to trust him and experience his reality for ourselves. And then there's that little detail in verse 11, which we might easily pass over. But remembering that John has included every detail for a purpose, we do well to savour such details and to ask God what it is he wants to teach us through them. The detail in verse 11 is that there were 153 fish caught in the net, which must have been an unusually large number, as John comments that even with this huge catch, the net didn't tear apart. So obviously people would have expected that with that large catch, it might have torn apart. Many interpretations have been put on this detail of the story and God can speak to us through everybody's interpretation and all the insights that he gives to his people to share with each other. Reverend Professor William Barclay tells of the interpretation of a Christian leader of long ago called Jerome. Jerome thought that there were 153 different species of fish in the sea. I suppose he meant the Sea of Galilee and that the catch included one of every kind of fish. So that the total catch is a sign that every sort of person in the world belongs. Every person in the world has a place in God's heart, in God's kingdom. God loves us in our great variety with all our differences and claims us as his own. And here's the thing, this great number and variety of fish was caught in the net and the net held them all. It didn't tear. And so an understanding, one understanding of the net is that the net is God's church, Christ's true church in which there is room for everyone, all sorts. Christ's arms are big enough to embrace and welcome all of us as his people, as his church. Christ's church is to be a place of welcome for all, reflecting God's kingdom. That was the earliest statement of belief, the earliest creed of the church. In his letter, in his letters, various letters, Paul again and again in different ways teaches this belonging of all in Jesus Christ. And this teaching is particularly clearly spelt out in Colossians 3 verse 11 and in Galatians 3 verse 28. Slightly different forms in both. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ's, then you're all Abraham's seed, which means you're heirs according to his promise. Here in today's reading, John is really telling us the same thing in a different way, in a story form. One of the hallmarks of the church is being inclusive, just as God's love is inclusive in Jesus. All who accept his life-giving forgiveness and let his forgiveness free them and shape their lives are indeed saved from cringing before the judgments and the resentments and the life-sapping harm of sin as we open our hearts to his forgiveness and let his forgiveness live in us and flow through us to the world. Amen. And may God bless to us the preaching of his word. And let's pray. Crucified and risen Christ Jesus, thank you for giving us life through the power of your love, which forgives us and frees us from the consequences of letting fear and sin rule us. 
May we so open our lives to you that we grow daily in your love, unafraid to let you keep healing us and keep freeing us from the resentments that try to get a grip on our lives. And may we be channels of your love in our daily lives. And joining the wider Presbyterian Church in prayer, using the Let's Pray notes, we pray for organisations and businesses as they begin to open up, and for those struggling as they must wait a bit longer. We pray for patience, for attention to safety, and wisdom to manage the economics of it all. And we continue to pray for all care workers and health care workers and all the staff who back up these services with cleaning and catering and maintenance and administration and all the various tasks that need to be done to keep our health service working well. We pray for sisters and brothers struggling to cope with health and also with the economic effects of the pandemic. And we think of those who are, who've lost their jobs and who are now seeking different employment. We think too of countries with much less resources than we have. And particularly we pray for Timor and the nearby islands, which were hit by the tropical cyclone uh, on Easter Sunday with severe winds and rains and floods and landslides causing lo loss of life and major damage to communications and roads and bridges and buildings. We pray for wisdom and fairness and strength for the leaders dealing with the recovery operation and for the church that they may encourage those affected with hope and with good example of generosity and kindness and justice. We also pray for the people of Brazil who are really badly affected by COVID-19. We pray that the church there, the leaders and the members, will bring God's healing and comfort and strength to their neighbours and to one another. We pray for the United Mission in Nepal, working hard to conclude agreements with the government about its work and witness, including work permits. And we pray for our own land, for the good leadership and fair general and generous dealings with generous and genuine, uh, genuine dealings with, with the real concerns that people have so that there can be a future in which we all live in peace and prosperity. We pray for churches in the North and the South, that members and leaders be encouraged to grow in faith and witness. And we pray for our families and our loved ones, and all who are worried, and those who are ill in body, or in mind, or in spirit or as a community, for those who are lonely and those who are bereaved. And we pause for a moment to bring to God whoever or whatever concerns he places on our hearts. Lord, keep us close to you and to each other day by day. Through the happiness and the struggles of life, teach us to grow in love of you and our neighbours as ourselves. And bring us in the end to join with all your people in the completeness of your immediate presence. And all our prayers we make in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. And we sing together, in Christ there is no east or west.
And now go back out into the world in the power of the risen Lord's forgiveness and the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. <laughs>